social workers. Welcome, welcome, and thank you for being here. Um, my name is Brett Peterson. I am a lecturer here at the School of Social Work, uh, full-time faculty, and I um, also am the coordinator of our Yuma program. We have a MSW program in Yuma, and um, and I, I I I help facilitate that program. Um, and I am passionate about licensure um, and, and wanting to help prepare our students for it. I mainly know the M, uh, MSW licensure, but, um, but uh, I, I'm really passionate. So I'm excited and thrilled to be here. And we have, um, we have a couple of people here today that are gonna talk about the importance of licensure, their own experience in getting licensed. Um, and Raquel, if, if Mika uh, ends up coming on. Will you will you message me? Okay. Um, so uh, so I just want to introduce. We have uh, Terry Weibel, um, and we have Ashley Blaine, and we have Margaret. Margaret, what's your last name? I see M. Macy. But, Macy. Macy. Margaret, Macy. Uh, yeah, and we have Margaret Macy, who, uh, if you were on our last panel, uh, has stayed around, um, and we're grateful for her um, uh, to. Um, to be here to, 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 to join our conversation. Um, so um, we're just gonna start off with having each of our panelists introduce themselves um, and kind of what no. <laughs> I was like, oh, is this just my computer or? He will rejoin soon. But um, you all, the panelists, can introduce yourself. I will let you take it away. Um, Ashley, do you want to go first? Sure. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me join your panel today. My name is Ashley Blaine. Um, I currently work over at the Mayo Clinic, and I am within one of our outpatient primary care programs called the Medallion Program. And I'm basically their integrated care provider. And so I provide integrated behavioral health services here. In addition, I teach for the Doctor to Behavioral Health Program at ASU, and I've been doing that since, let's see, the fall of 2013. So I'm really excited to talk to you guys about LCSW licensure today and answer any questions you may have. So thanks so much. Perfect. Terry, do you wanna go next? Sure. Yep. I am Terry Weibel. I am the founder and clinical director at Center for Compassion. Um, we are a group psychotherapy practice in Chandler, Arizona, and we specialize in um, supporting families after sudden, unexpected, and out-of-order death. So the majority of um, the families that we support are suffering from traumatic grief or enduring traumatic grief. Um, and part of the reason I'm here today is because we have a number of supervisees in our practice who are either currently getting supervision or have had supervision in the past for their clinical license and have gone through the process um, successfully, in addition to um, being able to share my own experience in the state of Arizona of having got gotten my licensure. Um, and we also host student interns at our practice as well, um, who are in their MSW program uh, through a number of different schools and with the School of Social Work at ASU. And I'm also a member of the Community Advisory Board at the School of Social Work. Awesome, thank you. And then Margaret. Hi, I'm Margaret Macy. I uh, just decided to stay on. I um, am the LCS, I'm an LCSW and I, I am the supervisor of our behavioral health um, internship program at Bayless Integrated Healthcare. So I work with students um, to finish their degree and then also what are the next steps to become licensed? Excellent. Sorry about that, I, I got kicked off. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. And now we had each of the panelists, um, Terry, Ashley, and Margaret, introduce themselves. Yay. Okay. Um, will you um, now just kind of share each of your experience about one, why you chose to get licensed, two, just briefly, kind of what that experience was. Um, let's first kind of talk about a little bit about uh, the uh, uh, if you got BSW license, but uh, if not, your LMSW, and then we'll we'll kind of come back um, and hit the clinical license in, later on in the conversation. Um, okay, so Terry, do you want to lead us off? And it's sure. good to see you, by the way. It's good to see you too. Yeah, I know. I told um, Miguel that I was excited you would be here today. Um, 
So yeah, I have no problem sharing about my experience with uh, licensure. I was licensed as an LMSW, and I guess I should go back. Your question is, why did I choose to get licensed? Um, and for me in particular, I really knew that I wanted to work in clinical practice. I wanted to do psychotherapy, and in our state, it's required to have a license. If you want to work in private practice, it's re you're required to have a license to be able to do so. Um, so I knew that that was something long-term that I wanted as a goal, um, and that's why I started the licensure process to begin with. Um, um, my experience in getting licensed was um, that I primarily actually worked in um, an OBHL licensed agency for a while before I had my license, which essentially means that when you have a master's degree, even if you don't have a license yet, you can work in um, agencies that are um, licensed in a certain way that you don't necessarily have to have your license yet in order to start practicing. Um, so I did that for a little while before I actually had my license and could start capturing some hours. So I did that for a little while while I waited to get my associate level license, got my associate level license, and then over years of time worked toward my independent license. Um, so it wasn't something that happened quickly. Um, but um, And the process was a little bit of a stressful one, but um, it was one that was supportive colleagues and the right information um, I was able to get through. Thanks. Ashley. Yeah. So uh, as soon as I graduated, I went and started working at what is now Honor Healthcare. Back in the day, it used to be Scottsdale Healthcare. And we had the opportunity to be able to get sponsored to get licensed. And so I got my associate level license right after I graduated from my master's program. Um, in terms of clinical license, I had a a similar experience as Terry. It took me a little while to do that. And I decided I wanted to do that because of the opportunities that are available once you have your clinical license. Um, if you want to do any type of clinical work or in a lot of organizations, if you want to kind of move up the ranks to be a supervisor or a director, those sorts of jobs usually require you to have a clinical license. Um, I know we're going to talk about the process in a little bit, but it is a challenge. It, is challenging <laughs> to be able to get your clinical license. And I, from my understanding, it sounds like the board is making that a more supportive and open process. Um, I actually ended up getting my clinical license in a different state, but I did my license in Colorado and in Arizona at the same time. And the paperwork differences were kind of mind blowing in terms of what was required in different states. So happy to talk about that when the time comes. Margaret. Yes. Yeah, so as I had mentioned in the last um, session that we were in, I did 10 years of community social work before I ever even thought about doing licensure. So I graduated in 06 with my master's, um, did a lot of that other work that I didn't need it, um, a license for technically, but I recognized that two things. One, and this is just a very real, very transparent thing I'm going to say, um, the pay difference between an LMSW and an LCSW. We have to acknowledge that there's, there's a difference. Um, and the only way you can become licensed with an LCSW is through direct clinical practice. So there's no other ways that you can do it. Um, anybody who's been through a supervision process, it's like one of two ways. It's either I've had the best supervision ever and I can't believe how fast it went, or it's I'm kind of pulling my hair out, like I'm not getting the hours that I need. This has taken me so much longer. Um, there's no consistency. I came from the latter. Uh, so knowing the difficulties I had, the inconsistencies, I now as a supervisor, and I feel comfortable in saying like Bayless as a whole, for those of um, our leadership who didn't grow up in the Bayless family and do their internship licensure and then further on with Bayless, um, we pride ourselves on the importance of, of good clinical supervision. It is, it's invaluable. It can make or break kind of where you land, I think. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, so just to, to, to have students uh, on who are on the line to, to just make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, for master's licensing, um, you can you can get the LMSW. You have to have the in, in in every every state has its own licensing board and its own rules. So it makes it difficult, um, as Ashley alluded to, to kind of go from state to state because each state kind of has um, different requirements. 
I will put in the chat in just a few minutes a link where you can see it has a you can go it's the ASWB website and has a link to all of the different uh, states licensing so if you're thinking of going somewhere else or you're one of our online students and you want to know the information on your your particular state um, please click that link we're going to be kind of talking um, on this panel from an, a, a kind of Arizona perspective. Um, so know that if you're in a different state or thinking about going to a different state, it might be slightly different. So I'll, I'll put that link as soon as I'm done talking. Um, so it, when you graduate or even uh, even before you graduate, uh, you can send in your, your application uh, to, uh, to apply for an LMSW. Um, and then uh, you, you go through that application process, the background check, and then they give you um, permission to take the ASWB test. Now those tests are universal. So you'll, you'll take the master's the exam. So the, the test itself um, are standardized, um, but, but the licensing levels sometimes aren't. Um, and in order to become a clinical social worker, which we'll talk about in a second, you first need your LMSW. So we, we wanna make sure we, we hit that first and we understand that process before we talk a little bit about LCSW. Because when you're brand new to the concepts, um, it can kind of run together. Um, you don't need any clinical hours to become an LMSW. Um, you do have to take the test. Some students like to, to study and we'll talk about um, preparing for that. Uh, with the panel in, in, in just a second. Um, but um, yeah, so that is that is the process. Uh, panel, did I, anything else you have to add to just that general process? I would just say that um, in order to apply for your L, so your associate license, you have to have your transcript posted. Yes. So you have to have the transcript posted at minimum um, and sometimes they miss that. Like they tried before, they won't accept the application yeah. unless your transcript is there. So you have to have already completed your program. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you have to have that. And and um, what Margaret is return, uh, referring to is, is that transcript and not, and it has to have where your degree is posted. So if you pull your transcript mm -hmm. up, it'll have everything else. Um, uh, um, after the, after like May 9th, you'll be able to pull up your con uh, your your um, you'll be able to pull up your transcript and you'll see the the degree conferred that's what that's what they're looking for you'll be able to get a um, you'll be able to get an unofficial copy of that but you will have to um, get an official copy of the state and they can they can send it right over um, and there's on the website the process of, of doing that or you can have it sent to you and include it in your packet um, I had something else I wanted to mention too, Brett. Um, I was just recently talking with um, the board chair, Patricia Dobratz is her name, um, and she was mentioning that something she feels like is underutilized sometimes for new graduates is a temporary license. Yes. Uh, that there is the possibility of getting a temporary license if you want to as soon as you're done, and it can be issued a little bit faster than waiting for the full associate license. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you want to make sure you check the checkbox on the application for the LMSW. There's a box on there you can check that says temporary temporary and they usually issue that faster than they issue the actual license itself. If you get that, something you need to be aware of is you have one year with a temporary license I'll give to you. The caveat with it is that if you don't pass your test on the first time around, you lose your temporary license and then you have to wait to test and pass the test before you get a license that can be issued again. And the reason that matters is because if you're working in an agency under a temporary license, you take the test, you don't pass the test, then you don't have a license at that point and you have to end treatment with all of your um, all of your clients at that point. So it's it's also though something to keep in mind that if if you want to have the process go a little faster, potentially, depending on you know your needs, your history, all of those things, there is the possibility of getting a temporary license as well. Yes. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, oh, Margaret, you had something real quick. Yeah, I, I just wanted to piggyback on that. Um, Patricia was my supervisor at Bayless for so long. She was the best supervisor I have ever had like hands down, she is just an amazing human being. Um, 
and she actually has her own practice that helps students and people who are in the application process if they want overview because she's such an expert in it. But anyway, you do, this is how it's been working for us. Social workers can get their temporary license. For Bayless, we're not hiring anybody that has a BHT or is not yet has their temporary or their associate level license. Once you get, you, so you put that whole packet together, assuming that you're, no, if you're graduating from ASU, you're graduating from an accredited program. If you didn't graduate from an accredited program, that's a whole different process, but we don't have to worry about that now. So you submit your application. They can, within a few weeks, like Terry was saying, give you that temporary. And then once that temporary is given, then you are approved to take your LMSW test. Once you pass your LMSW test, then it reverts back, but your temporary goes, they honor it from when the time your temporary was um, assigned to you. So that's a really important piece that you don't want to miss. No. And so I, I have a, oh, oh yeah, I, I, Ashley, go ahead. As I said, I have a quick question about that then in terms of, I know we're still talking about associate level licensure, but going towards that clinical licensure and um, you're collecting hours, are you able to count those hours back from when you have that temporary license? That's, okay. That's, that's, that's the that's advantage that. of it. Yes. Wonderful. That, yeah. We are um, the only program that does that. Okay. MFTs can't do that. Counselors can't do that. They have to wait until they take their national certification test before the board will license them. They will not give them associates. Um, so, so yeah, so with that, that, in, that in mind, um, so you, you don't get a temporary license and unless you're applying for the LMSW. Mm -hmm. so, to, so how you don't get a, you don't apply for a temporary license by itself. It's part of that process. And like Terry said, check it. It's an additional $50 um, around that. I, I think it's, I'll, I'll look it up and, and put it in the chat, but it's, it's around $50. Um, and again, you do not need a test. You just have to, you know, pass the background check. Um, and, and the reason being is once, once you get approved, uh, once you get approved to take your uh, test, you have one year to take it. So students, some, some students with test anxiety or whatever, like to do some additional planning and, and training. And, and, and uh, they like to have uh, people that they know have go, go through and take the test and talk to them. And that's okay, you can do that. Um, and if you have that temporary license, you can still, um, if, if you're, sometimes agencies will hire you with that temporary agent that temporary license and you can begin to get those those clinical hours so um we highly recommend that you do um it is that extra 30 dollars but but that temporary license is that because what it does is it does allow you to if you feel like you need time an extra time to take the test you 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 have that um so so that's that's kind of that's kind of the overview of what it takes um, to get an LMSW. And so um, one of my, my next question was, Terry, and, and you already did it, but um, would you would you all recommend that, that students get the temporary license if they are? So that's a, yeah. okay. I also think it depends on the circumstances because if you, I might say, if you do have test anxiety, it could potentially increase your test anxiety because you have the sense of having to pass on the first time around. Um, you still, I, I want to mention, if you have, if, you, if you're applying for your associate, you do have, I think it's three chances to take it in order to pass it completely. In that year, you have three opportunities to take it and pass it and still get your license. But if you have your temporary and you don't pass it on the first time around, then you lose your temporary. That's the only thing I would say. But otherwise, there's there's no downside to having a temporary yeah. license. You lose your temporary, but you don't lose your ability to That's take, right. You still have two more record. opportunities to take yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're just kind of in the boat as if you never clicked the temporary thing. Exactly. That's but right. if you do have clients and you are an agency, Without that temporary license, you have Terry's to exactly right. The ethical thing would be, the legal thing would be, you have to step away from the from that um, situation. Um, yes. So um, with um, so I want to try and talk. Um, uh, and again, we'll we'll talk a little more about the LMSW. Then we'll we'll jump to the LCSW. But uh, imagine uh, both Margaret Ashley and Terry to your LMSW. Um, 
what what was the process like applying and kind of the overview of kind of the test what what was it like and what advice would you have um, for students who are wanting to get their LMSW what is it that they need to to know um, so uh, whoever wants to jump in so I would say the biggest piece of advice I can give you is your, I know ASU used to have this, I assume that they still do, but they had kind of a test prep program that you could go through where one of the professors would really teach to the test and then you would get practice tests. So a big thing with the licensure exams is learning how they ask the questions. Mm -hmm. And I found the most valuable thing with the LMSW and the LCSW test was doing practice exams and really learning how those questions are asked. And you can go back and reference if you got something wrong, kind of understanding why. Um, but that would be my big recommendation is if you can do a test prep course or take practice, practice exams is really invest some time in doing that. Ashley, just to, to jump in. Um, Real quick. Um, so um, years ago, we we used to ha have a class. It was an additional fee. Students would take it and they would do the test. But that's kind of the course Ashley's talking about. Um, during the pandemic, um, we uh, have put that online. So it's a separate, oh, it's okay. a separate Canvas course, and it's really it's really cool because it's it's three modules. The first module is we talk to the director of Arizona Behavioral Health Examiners, um, Director uh, Toby Zavalis, and she talks about all the things you need to do before you apply. She also mentions all the things that, because um, a lot of times if an application is not complete or if it's missing, they have to send it back. Mm -hmm. And that just, that can just be, that can just take a lot of time, depending on where the board's at, how many applications, everything. Sometimes it can it, it can take a little longer for the board to respond and give you permission to take the test. Um, so if it, if it gets sent back, it just almost puts you back in the, the queue. So she talks all about the, the things. She also answers some tough questions about what if I have a substance abuse history, how do I disclose that? And, and what am I legally have to disclose? All of those questions are in there. That's the first module. The second module, is a Dr. Cora Bruno, and she's kind of what um, Ashley's talking about. She's going through all of the, she breaks through what the test is testing, all the different content areas, um, how to best study for it. And then she talks a, about um, kind of the questions of the test. The, the questions are really unique because they're not like, um, uh, you know, who's the father of behaviorism? Um, they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're questions like you have a client and um, they are really worried about um, their boss attacking them. What would you do first? And all of the questions are all things you would probably do with the client um, at one point, but you have to kind of pick what would you do first? And so it's, it's really reading the test questions very carefully and then being able to reason them out. So Cora will prepare that module two. Then module three, you're lucky enough to hear my um, <laughs> uh, high pitched squeaky voice because what I do is we go through a, a practice test of 50 questions. We do 10 questions at a time and um, it's an ASWB approved practice test. So it's the actual test people that make the, the, the practices. And we go through, uh, you'll see the test question, you'll get a chance to, on the video, guess which you think it is. And then I come on right after and explain it's B, and this is why it's B, and, and this is how you can approach. So we're not only giving you the answers, but we're giving you the rationale behind it. And that's really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all free. So that's going to be available to all graduating uh, students in the MSW program beginning, we're hoping, April 1st. Um, and you'll have access to that um, to about eight months after you graduate, because that's how like Canvas allows that. Um, so you'll be able to access that. Um, 
So that that is coming. So I'm glad, Ashley, that was your advice because we have that built in. This is something that we're wanting to do um, better and and make this more accessible. So that's that's something that you will have access to um, beginning uh, April 1st. We're just updating it. Um, okay, Margaret, Terry, kind of um, what are some advice you have for people getting their LMSW? Do it now. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. You can, even if you're not doing clinical work or working towards your independent license, um, it still matters because you can be licensed as a BSW or an MSW for a long time. It, you don't have to be working towards the higher um, licensure. And it is a benefit to do it now because you're in that school mode. You're, you're already like, you have the momentum um, to stop. And I know like that, the idea to just be away from it and not have to deal with any sort of test ever again is so appealing. And like, you think that once you graduate, you're like, you're good. And then social work's like, yep, no, sorry. You have two more very difficult tests that you have to take. Um, find a study buddy, find somebody that you can, you can talk to about it, that you can process it out with. Um, you guys know this, we already, we know it. They put it in a very tricky sort of format, but reading the questions fully um, and then going back and really making sure that you understand the question they're asking, because that's where they trip you up. Not in, the, not in what the answer is, but how they word it. So pay attention to the wording. Do not hesitate to do it as soon as you can, as soon as you're degree pros do it. You will not regret it. You will absolutely not regret doing it. Quickly. Yeah, I agree with what Margaret's saying about getting it ASAP. There's no reason to to wait to get it. Um, and I kind of feel like it can only hinder you by waiting and waiting. Um, that if you can just get it done right away, um, it's one less thing that you're thinking about and one less thing to worry about also. Um, and in terms of like preparation for the test, there's a couple things I I did buy like the whole comprehensive package of the book and the CDs and the, you know, everything to try to study with. And at the time I had a CD player in my car, which I don't even know if that exists in a car anymore, but I had a CD player in the car and I listened to them on repeat all the time, all day, you know, no matter where I was going, I think I was working at Gila River at the time. And so I was driving there, you know, 45 minutes every day, listening to them that I would recommend, um, you know, finding some sort of way that works for you, you know, whether it's audio or it's um, visual learning as a way of, um, of getting that information input. And um, there's apps now as well that will send you like a test question a day kind of thing that you can utilize. Um, and I also highly, highly recommend just studying the code of ethics inside it out, because one of the things that's going to be helpful in answering those questions is that um, the code of ethics is part of what you need to be informed about in order to make the right choice on the test with what the first thing you would do is because it all relates back to code of ethics. So those are my recommendations. Yeah. And the one other thing I would add is even getting the LMSW is going to open up job opportunities. Because like where I work at Mayo yeah. Clinic, you, in order to be hired as a social worker, you have to have that LMSW. There are jobs specifically for LCs, but in most healthcare settings, if any of you are interested in going into healthcare, the LMSW is going to be required. Ashley, I'm so glad you, you brought that up and, and Margaret and Terry, both kind of that message of don't wait. So um, what, what we're seeing, and, and, and let, let me know, I, th I think you guys would agree. Um, when we graduated, um, you know, unless it was kind of thought like, unless you're gonna go in, get your clinical license, you don't need your LMSW. And that's, mm -hmm not the case anymore and in fact you can get your lmsw and that's the only license you get and 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 you renew it every two years and that's fine and a lot of uh, hospital social work school social work that is wh where you you'll you'll be finding you don't ever need to go into the clinical license so sometimes we think of lmsw is just just necessarily a step towards clinical license it is that but it can also be you know, depending on your career, that's can be where you're at. And that's awesome. What we're seeing now is a lot of grants now that are coming from the federal government and, and different things that give money to have to hire social workers, even on the macro level, they're looking for licensure that that's starting to now be built in. Because what what happens when someone's licensed, 
that agency automatically knows that they've had a super extensive background check. They'll still do their own, but they know they've had a super extensive. They also know that the person is beholden to the um, code of ethics, that, that, that if, they don't, uh, if they don't live by the code of ethics, uh, they're unethical, that there are consequences. When someone's not licensed, there's not necessarily consequences. Um, so, so you're really seeing that like with licensure, all this like built-in protections for employers and grant, grant funders, that, that it's just easier to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go with a licensed person for this. So even if you are, are here and saying, you know what, I don't think I'll ever do one-on-one -on -one clinical counseling, um, we would really encourage you to, to still get that LMSW. And the course, the content that you're learning in your uh, degree program is what you need. You know, now you may, may need to refresh it and you may need to, to, to learn, you know, pick up on, on certain things um, where, where, where you might be. And that's why practice tests are so great because you can go take a practice test and you can get the results and you can say, oh, look, I, I, I had really tough questions on this area. I need to, to do a little extra study. Um, so yeah, so highly encourage that, that um, LMSW um, regardless of, of your situation. Um, I was also um, wanting to add, and this is something that people don't often know until they get into this, um, like deep, deeper clinical work. With insurances, you can bill as an LMSW. You have to have a license to bill insurances. There are specific insurances like Aetna who will only accept an LCSW or an independently licensed person. So that is kind of like the um, bump or the reason for a lot of people in private practice to go and get the clinical license because when you take that test, it is very clinical. It's asking you pretty clinical questions. Um, something else that is really like we're seeing a huge gap. There is a in, ser in services for like the baby boomer population. So if somebody has Medicare, if a, if, if, a, if a person has Medicare, a client, and they want to go to counseling, they have to see an LCSW or a psychologist for counseling services. An LPC, so a licensed, pre a licensed professional counselor, um, somebody who's licensed with marriage and family therapy, they cannot take clients with straight Medicare. If you think about the population that is now retiring and, you know, currently in that space that they have their Medicare, there's just this huge gap of, there's not enough of us. There's not enough LCSWs mm -hmm. to fill the need. And I don't know why Medicare made this rule, but CMS made this rule that if you have that insurance, you can only see a social worker, uh, a licensed social, a clinical social worker or a psychologist. A psychologist really at this point, I don't know a whole lot of them. They're actually doing real therapy. They do more, a lot more of like a valuative sort of work. Um, that's really a huge part of why your, your LC is important. So, um, yeah, so let's kind of transition to LC, the LC and talk about what that is and the difference. Before we do that, is there anyone on the panel or any, um, let me check the, uh, questions real quick. Any questions specifically on the LMSW or anything the panel wants to add? Good. Okay. Um, I'll go through the chat too. And if there's anything, I'll either answer it or come back to it. Um, okay. So once, once we have our LMSW, we are, if we choose to, be able to work through the LCSW process. Um, uh, Terry or Margaret, do you want to kind of give just a real overview of kind of what what it takes to become an LCSW? Um, just kind of uh, summarize that process. The minimum process is you have to have 100 hours of direct supervision. Um, that supervision can come from an LCSW uh, um, for 50 of those hours or it, you can have somebody of a different discipline for 50 of those supervision hours. It's one super, it's one hour of clinical supervision for every 40 hours worked. So there, that has to, 
that has to match. That's really important, especially for people who have an associate's license and they're in like a private practice situation. Because if you are associate licensed and in a private practice situation, your requirements for supervision are different than if you were, you know, under an agency. Um, so there's that piece. You really, you really got to. Uh, Margaret, can I, can I, can I jump into uh -huh. um, that supervision piece is key, especially if you end up working because uh, it's one to every 40. And so you, you will end up having to throw away some hours of direct practice. If you're, if you're not within that, one of the best questions you can ask as you're interviewing for positions where you'll be able to do your LMSW is talk to me about supervision. You know, do they have a, you know, do they have a, a licensed clinical social worker that can provide that, or, you know, or, or, or someone else um, to have those questions, but to also to ask when, how often, how dedicated they are. Um, my, my advice, I always tell students, uh, never let your clinical supervisor schedule supervision for Friday afternoon. Um, my very first, my very first, it was Friday afternoon and it got canceled every other week uh, because you know the other week everyone's everyone's fried so and I, and, I, and I I had to advocate for myself I had to stand up and say hey wait a second I'm we need to switch my supervision because this isn't happening and I'm you know I'm gonna have to let hours go um so um yeah so that is so so key that supervision that hundred hours supervision but also you want that supervision just to be a great Clinician, you need it in this beginning of this field. You absolutely need it. And so so advocating for yourself for supervision is great. And it should be one of the questions you should ask when you're interviewing. Um, Margaret, keep going. I'm sorry yeah. for interrupting. No, it's okay. I was just also going to say another really good question to ask anybody that you're interviewing, whether it's like for work or internship, is what is that supervisor's um, style? Because just like everything in behavioral health or what we do, there are different theories on how you provide clinical supervision. So like I'm like a developmental, like that's kind of what I follow um, as a supervisor, that there's like this novice with somebody, then there's like this more intermediate, and then you have a more advanced um, practitioner. So definitely look into that. Um, that's probably all I got to say. And just, um, yeah, you have to demand it. Don't be afraid to demand it that you need those hours because it's no and joke. Yeah. One thing I would be aware of is your supervisor needs to keep their license active. So if at any point your supervisor lets their license lapse or something like that happens, you will lose those hours. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that I know somebody that that happened to, they lost, I think about a quarter of their hours because their supervisor had let their license lapse and didn't tell them. And so just kind of making sure you have good communication with your supervisor. And I would um, second what Brett and Margaret said in terms of finding someone that you really respect their clinical style and that you feel like you can get good feedback from because this is such an important time in your development as a clinician that you really need to be able to sit and process with them and kind of figure out how to move forward with your clients. Yeah, and I know this is super early to tell you this, but um, there's a form that they fill out like, hey, I've done this many hours for you and stuff. Um, you are going to have supervisors that will leave, or you will leave a, a place before you get your um, your LCSW. It's important that when they're leaving or you're leaving, that you have them fill out that section because tracking someone down again yeah. can 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 be just exhausting. Um, and then if they leave the state or if they're licensed, I mean, it just it can become so so you know you you take the responsibility on you um, to make sure that those forms are signed, that the supervision logs are being filled out, like all of those things, even though the clinical supervisor is supposed to be filling out the log, you, you, gotta, you have to take ownership of that. Um, so yeah, so there's the 40 hours um, and then you reapply kind of very similar to the same, to, to what you did before. And then you also, 
surprise, get to take another test. Um, and it's similar to the, the first one, but I think as someone said, Margaret, Margaret or Terry said, it's a lot more clinically driven. So it's a lot more kind of a lot of situational. What are you going to do in this type of situation? What's best? Um, Terry, Can I just I back up? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I there was a couple pieces I sort of noticed, and um, one of them is uh, not all students know that there are only certain things that count toward direct hours, yes. and the yes. definition by law of direct hours is psychotherapy. So if you are not providing psychotherapy you are not getting clinical hours. So if you're working in a hospital setting, even if you're working in a crisis setting, psychoeducation is all that crisis counts for. You can only get 400 hours of your hours toward psych direct psychotherapy with doing something like crisis work. And you're required mm -hmm. to do 1600 direct psychotherapy hours in order to obtain your LCSW. So it's 1600 direct psychotherapy hours while getting 100 supervision hours that Margaret was referring to. 50 of those can be done by someone from another discipline, but 50 have to be done by an LCSW who's either board approved or that has, um, an, you could get approval otherwise if they're not listed on the board website. Um, and in addition to that, it's important also to remember that um, the they used to have a requirement for indirect hours that you would have to count them but as of last year that is no longer a requirement so the only thing you oh, have right. to pay attention to is how many exact direct hours that you're doing um and margaret i know you mentioned one for every 40 it's my understanding that one for every 40 has to do with an associate who's in private practice that if it's an individual who's in an agency or is being um, not own, doesn't own the actual practice itself, it's one hour in any month in which they see a client. That's my understanding of it. it uh, that could be different than what I understand, but that's my understanding of it. Um, but the the most important part, I think, for most students is understanding what direct practice means and what yes. um, direct hours are. I think that is a really good point to bring up because there have been a lot of people that thought they were getting clinical hours doing certain kinds of work and then they apply to the board and the board says, I'm sorry, this doesn't count. Um, and I know a lot of the hospital systems are really working to try to figure out how to get people clinical hours within an inpatient hospital setting, because typically in the past that is not counted for clinical work at all. Um, so I know Phoenix Children's is doing some of that and the inpatient at Mayo Clinic is really trying. And a lot of it is coming down to where people work within the hospital. So if you have someone that's on an oncology unit and the patients are there for a long time and they can really provide some of those clinical services, then they're starting to get supervision from some of us that are clinically licensed. Um, but if someone is on like a typical floor where people are in and out in two days, then that's not going to be an opportunity for them to get those clinical services. Um, and so if you are really wanting to do that and you're looking more at a healthcare setting, those are good questions to ask in terms of what, where would this job be located and will I have the opportunity to provide clinical services that would count towards licensure. Um, and one other thing is, and I don't know the exact breakdown, maybe Terry or Margaret know this, but some of those 100 hours for clinical supervision can be group supervision. And that can be really beneficial because you hear how other people are doing as well. But I think, is it only 20 hours for group? I think it can be because it's individual, uh -huh. a group of one to two, yeah. and then anything okay. more than, than a group of um, three to six. A okay. clinical supervisor cannot have more than, I think it's six um, okay. associates in a, that group supervision, it won't count. Yeah, gotcha. It's okay. a that kind of, uh, Yeah, and mm -hmm. then another thing I wanted to mention is that a lot of different places do different things. So. Mm -hmm. When the, as supervisors, we are responsible to keep your supervision notes for seven years after we're done seeing you, like, or you leave the agency, we are still responsible for that. Um, those records are very important. They can come back and be called and requested. You as the supervisee do not complete that paperwork. The onus of completing your supervision note is on the supervisor. You have to sign it. You have to date it, but what is in the meat of that 
is our responsibility as as supervisors and the board is very specific about what they want us to be reviewing during supervision yes. so just remember that that's really important and to follow up on that on the board website they have a template mm -hmm. that your supervisor can use to complete the supervision notes so for anything related to doing your licensure follow what the board is recommending exactly because that takes away an opportunity for to miss something um so if they give you a form or a recommended form use that form don't come up with your own form, use what they have for you um, so that you know it's what they're looking for. Um, and I just pulled up the rules for clinical supervision. Um, and I know we had been talking about how 50 of those hours have to be provided by an LCSW. The one thing it says on here is that one, so you can do the other 50 hours with like an LPC or um, a psychologist. Um, yeah, but you cannot use um, a licensed substance abuse counselor or a LISAC. They will not count that for clinical supervision. I just saw that, so I thought I'd bring it up. Yeah, the only other provision I was thinking that we didn't cover is that it's no less than 24 months. So you have oh, to yes, yes. that, that yep. 1,600 hours over two years or more of time. What was your average time, Margaret, Ashley, and Terry, to get your LCS? Okay. So I have like a bragging moment. Um, the when I I I, I was um, supervising a clinic um, before I transitioned into the internship director, and the two um, therapists that I hired, they right at the twenty five month mark were able to apply for their licensure, and that made me so I was so happy because like you, you hear so many horror stories about it getting delayed and and that sort of thing, and also there's something like about waiting till month 25. Anybody that I know that's gone at the exact 24 months, some reason their application gets kicked back. I don't know why that is, but you do have a specific amount of time that the board allows for you to gain those supervision hours. And also you can only have, I think it's like five or six mm -hmm. supervisors listed. So if you have yeah. a supervisor, or there's a lot of turnover in an agency, you got to be really watching who's giving you what hours. Um, for me personally, I I should have got, um, I transferred, to, I, I came into Bayless with about 67 of my supervision hours. So I was almost licensed at the other facility that I was working at. Uh, it was just inconsistent, but it took me about three and a half years to get my, from my LMSW to my LC, like, and it awarded and I saw the pay bump. I saw I had the certificate um, and all those things. Oh, and also just real quick, if you work for an agency and you become licensed, so if you're working for Bayless and you become licensed, independently licensed with us, and you, you'll get a new employment contract because now you're licensed and there's usually a, a pay difference for that. Um, you, they will sometimes some agencies because credentialing with insurance is expensive and difficult and time consuming, agencies can put into their contract, you must stay, stay for a certain number of years or months because the cost of getting you licensed independently with those insurance providers is, is substantial. So just remember that you're reading your contracts. Um, if you leave before then, they can put the cost of your credentialing back to you. This is a common practice with agencies. So, so keep that in mind. Um, I will speak a little bit about my LCSW licensure process in it. There's good learning in it. Um, I applied and later on realized I applied with 23 and a half months of, of hours. <laughs> and I had two weeks between jobs even though I had accumulated all of the direct hours I needed and all of the supervision. And I was fastidious about every single hour I had spreadsheets and I had signatures and I was just so um, careful about everything. But I had two weeks of time I hadn't had direct hours and supervision. But 
because I know um, how important it is to make sure we're, you know, following all rules, ethics, regulations, I continued to get supervision even after I submitted my license, my application. So I submitted my application, but for two months of time, I was continuing to work in the agency, continuing to get licensing hours, et cetera. So all I had to do was submit that additional time into my application and I was good to go. So um, there is uh, something for learning processes for all of you that once you submit your application, it doesn't mean that you're done with your supervision. <laughs> so mine was a little complicated as well. Um, I had been doing a lot of work in crisis and a lot of integrated behavioral health work because that is my background. Um, and this was during a time within the, or, uh, the licensing board where they changed some of the rules as to what counted. And so things like integrated behavioral health and crisis didn't count anymore. So I had a whole bunch of hours that just kind of disappeared, um, which was very frustrating. Um, but like I said, I ended up actually getting licensed in Colorado. So I had relocated and worked in an organization that did individual psychotherapy. Um, and so once I restarted that process, it took about that 25 month mark. Um, and I the licensing process in Colorado is significantly easier than it is in Arizona. And so everything that I did, I did it in essentially towards the Arizona standards. So my supervisor filled out the Arizona forms. We did everything. And when I had to submit from out of state, I sent in a packet that was this thick. And in Colorado, I think I filled out two pieces of paper online. So me, as Brett was saying, each state is very different, um, but being, making sure that you're dotting all those I's, crossing all those T's, doing everything is going to be really beneficial to make it a smooth process. Um, thank you guys so much. We're almost out of time. We had a question about, um, about pass rates. Like, is it common to pass? Um, and I actually have that data. And so let me share it with you real quickly. Um, oh, can... Can someone allow me, Miguel or Raquel, are you able to let me share my screen? Yes, I will make you a host right now. Okay. And I'll briefly, because we've got a couple questions about that. Go. Okay. So as you can see, these are our passwords. We just actually obtained these. So this is new information or not new but information we have available um so you can see this is for the lmsw um that are that are that our um pass rate um at asu is higher than the 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 national average which is great um and you can see that we're we're right around um that 80 percent um mark um for students students beginning to pass that first time about about 78 to 80 percent um pass you can see the numbers are quite a bit higher once uh people go to their lcsw just because they have a lot of years of experience and they've already taken the test uh, before but so there's a slightly higher rate but um so you can see this is kind of where what the pass rates are for our ASU alumni, um, so yeah, I, I hope that I hope that helps. Um, um, I, you know, the big the biggest thing is um, as far as when it comes to tests is is being prepared. Um, and uh, I, I, and my advice to you would be use use the free licensure program, um, and then go ahead and 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 do the practice test with us. But then I would. I would purchase another practice test through ASWB. I think they're eighty dollars. Take it, see where you're at. If you if you pass it, that's a pretty good indicator you're going to do well. If not, then I'll give you some areas of where you need to study. Um, there are some wonderful programs. I did a I did, I was like Terry. I I have some test anxiety, so I knew I needed like it all. So I did a full on program with audio, and I was just like Terry. I need, chance I got, I was listening to them. Um, and I, and I, I blocked off regular study sessions because I know that I needed that confidence to like, I know I needed to study. Um, and not, and I wasn't learning anything new, but it was just, it was, it was to combat that, um, test anxiety. 
um, and and uh, we can kind of share. Uh, you can always email me, and I can share kind of the different commercialized um, options there are out there. But start with our program first, and and see see how you feel after that, and then if you need additional help, do that. Um, I was okay. just going to say real quick that um, learning your own regulation skills, learning how to calm yourself in the midst of something that is naturally anxiety provoking. This is a naturally anxiety provoking situation taking this test. So much of everything that we have done to that moment, I mean, it all comes to that moment. So there's this pressure mentally, emotionally. Um, so just really making sure you're doing that check in with yourself. Like, how do I calm myself down? Like why, you know, my heart racing, like whatever works for you, whether it's, you know, diaphragmatic breathing or, you know, you have more like a DBT sort of like tangible, you know, something that helps you calm down. Um, because I really think that our specific program at ASU puts you in that place so you can be successful in passing that test. Mm -hmm. It's trusting yourself and keeping yourself calm. So that logical part of your brain is what's on, not, you know, your Oh my God, what's going to happen? I'm going to fail. And then my life's over. And then, you know, like that sort of stuff. Don't, you don't want to, you don't want to sit in that space. Yeah. Um, Victor, you asked once we get our license, um, CUs. So yes, in order to maintain your license, you do, uh, you need to uh, renew it every two years. Um, and you need 32, how is this? 30, 30, 30, 30 yeah. CU credits. Um, and they, they, they have a breakdown, certain in cultural, certain in ethics. Um, and then, yeah, so you, you, you do need those um, opportunities. Um, to, you to do not them. need to, I'm sorry, you do not need to retake the test. No. I think that was this, yeah. Yeah, only, only, only when you go for your LCSW. And again, as we talked about, again, LCSW is that very clinical specific work. That's how you get the hours. If that's not where your career trajectory is, then, you know, that may not be ever what you deal with. Um, thank you guys so much. I am so grateful. We had such a knowledgeable panel um, and so helpful. Uh, I, I, I did not have this when I graduated and this is why I'm so passionate about it. Um, and I am so grateful because this would have been, I, I hope th this is really great information and to have people who've been there and done it and um, it was great. So I just wanna thank Margaret, Ashley and Terry. Um, thank you so much. Um, any, we have one more minute, any last words? Good luck. Yeah, just good luck to all of you and thank yeah. you for being social yeah. workers. <laughs> and if, you know, if you have any questions, I think that uh, most of us who do this type of you know supervision work, um, whether you come to us as, for employees or internship, like really it's about like having the information and having it come from a source that's not just like BS, like really truly somebody who, who has that experience um, helps a little bit. So don't hesitate. I think we're all open to answering questions and helping any way we can. Absolutely. I'm just putting my contact information in the chat right now in case you guys yeah. have any questions. All right, thank you. Thank you all for coming and for your expert opinions. Um, we are going to transfer over to the career fair portion. So the Zoom link um, is going to be in the original invite. And so that's where each employer is going to give a little bit of a pitch about their company and who they're looking for and what they can provide you as a potential employee. And then it's going to go into breakout rooms. So feel free to head over to the career fair. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Terry, Ashley Marker, thank you guys so much.